Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, Behind the Story, where we answer the questions you have about your favorite classic authors. What inspired your favorite author to write their novels? What was going on in the world at the time? Follow along with us as we tell you what was happening in the world while your favorite authors wrote your favorite classics. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Today we will be talking about Théâtre Historique. The Théâtre Historique, a former Parisian theater located on the Boulevard du Temple, was built in 1846 for the French novelist and dramatist Alexandre Dumas. Plays adapted by Dumas from his historical novels were mostly performed and, although the theater survived the 1848 revolution, it suffered increasing financial difficulty and closed at the end of 1850. In September 1851, the building was taken over by the Opera National and renamed again in 1852 to Théâtre Lyrique. In 1863, during Haussmann's renovation of Paris, it was demolished to make way for the Place de la République. The name Théâtre Historique was revived by some other companies in the late 1870s and early 1890s. Dumas tells the story behind the founding of the Théâtre Historique in his 1867 memoir Historie des Mes Bêtes. His drama adapted from his novel The Three Musketeers had premiered on October 27, 1845 on the Boulevard du Temple at the Théâtre de l'Ambugui Comique. On that occasion, Dumas met the 21-year-old Duke of Montpensier, youngest son of the French king Louis-Philippe. The Duke invited Dumas to his box at the end of the performance and during their conversation, he offered to use his influence to help Dumas obtain a license to open a theater. The duke first approached the Minister of the Interior, Tainagui Duchantel, who declined, saying that Paris already had enough theaters. The duke then went directly to his father. By March 14, 1846, the privilege was assigned to Hippolyte Hostein, former stage manager of the Ambigu Comique, who had been designated by Dumas as the director of his new theater. The license granted the right to present prose dramas and comedies, as well as lyric choral works for two months of each year. A company was formed on March 24th, composed of Dumas, Monsieur Videl, pseudonym of Alexandre Paulet, former director of the Comédie Francais, the banker Auguste Armand Bourgoin, son of a celebrated actress, Monsieur Adwin, principal proprietor of the Passage Joffrey and Hostein. Within a month, the company purchased two sites on the Boulevard du Temple near its intersection with the Rue des Fombourg du Temple, the former Hotel Foulon, and a small café bar, the Epicai, next to the Cirque Olympique. Together, the two sites cost about 600,000 francs. Work began almost immediately under the direction of the architect Pierre Anne de Dreau and the architectural and stage set director painter Charles Sicon. The awkward site wedged between two buildings at the front and wide at the back on the Rue des Fossiers du Temple required great skill in adapting to its new purpose. The façade on the Boulevard du Temple was unusually tall and narrow, not more than 26 feet in width. The entrance was flanked by two pairs of engaged fluted ionic columns on a high base with two broad sculpted bands on the lower portion of each column, two facing caryatides presenting in profile to the boulevard and representing the muses of tragedy and comedy, supported the flat architrave at the front of a semicircular entryway with four equally spaced ionic columns delimiting the curvature of the inside doorway. Above the entablature of the entrance was an unusual semicircle Corinthian balcony enclosed at the front by a thin balustrade surmounted with four lampposts. At the top of the two double-width flat pilasters bracketing the balcony were masks of tragedy and comedy below which were engraved the names of six playwrights. On the left, Corneille, Racine, and Molière, and on the right, Shakespeare, in the 19th century spelling, Schiller, and Lope de Vega. The balcony was covered with a semi-dome above a semicircle frieze. Both the cupola and the frieze were painted in fresco by Joseph Guchard. A central group of figurines in the cupola represented poetry, leading comedy by the hand, and tragedy each carrying their respective attributes, the comic mask and the poniard. Below these to the right were Asilis, Sophocles, Euripides, Seneca, Shakespeare, Corneille, Racine, Voltaire, Schiller, Talma, Nerit, Gluck, and Mechul, and to the left, 
Aristophanes, Menander, Plautus, Terence, Moliere, Goethe, Lope de Vega, Cervantes, Reginard, Mauvois, Millamars, Mozart, and Gretry. The panels in the frieze portrayed the Temple of Bacchus and scenes from Media, Phaedra, Othello, Sina, Le Misanthrope, Le Bourgois Gunahim, Faust, Mahomet, William Tell, and Liavier. Flanking the semi-dome on the front were pairs of figures representing on the left Corneille Cid and Chimene, and on the right Shakespeare's Hamlet and Ophelia. The central figure of the break in the circular pediment represented the genius of modern art. All the sculpture was the work of Jean-Baptiste Jules Klengmann, also known for his sculpture work at the Fontaine Louvois. The entrance vestibule was as narrow as the facade, only 60 feet long and 14 feet high. A foyer, located on the floor above the vestibule, provided access to the exterior balcony and was surprisingly warm, with tones of white gold enhanced with dark red of the velvet coverings of the divans and chairs, and light from elaborate chandeliers of a fantastic and capricious design. The shape of the auditorium was quite different from most Parisian theaters of the time. Being an ellipse, the long axis of which was aligned parallel to the stage rather than perpendicular to it. This arrangement was reminiscent of Palladio's 16th century theater, the Teatro Olimpico, in Vizinha. The long axis from the back of the boxes on one side to the other was 65 feet in length, while the short axis was 52 feet. The exceptional width of the opening of the stage at 36 feet was considered advantageous to the presentation of spectacle, while the shape of the house favored excellent sight lines and good acoustics, since it brought most of the spectators close to the stage. The striking oval ceiling was designed and painted by Charles Sacan, Jules de Tillier, and Eduardo de Splichin. The scene in the center depicted Apollo on his chariot, pulled by four horses, followed by Aurora, the Hours, the Muses, and Arts and Sciences, among others. Two chandeliers were suspended at opposite ends of the central oval, which was unlike most other Parisian theaters, where, typically, a single chandelier hung from the center of the ceiling and sometimes obstructed views of the stage from the galleries. Surrounding the scene with Apollo were painted in perspective a balustrade topped by a colonnade of double Corinthian columns. The colonnade was interrupted at the midpoints between the vertices by four thrones occupied by the muses of painting, comedy, music, and tragedy. The theater was designed to accommodate two divergent types of audience, that of the working class, common to the Boulevard du Temple, and that of the most brilliant society of Paris on whom the directors of the theater depended as their patrons. What was desired, therefore, was a building so arranged that the elite of Parisian society might find every provision for their comfort, without in any way trenching upon that of the ordinary public of the theaters of the boulevard. Three large balconies were flanked either side by Corinthian pavilions, with two levels of stage boxes crowned with highly ornamented circular pediments. The lower box on the left was especially luxurious and was originally intended for the use of the Duke of Montpensier. It was connected by a short passageway to an adjoining circular salon. The first tier was fronted with a balustrade and included dress circle seating in front rows of boxes, each with its own small private sitting room behind it. Two large amphitheaters extended back from the second and third tier balconies, providing a large number of less expensive seats. Finally, above the third tier were two small lateral balconies, sometimes referred to as the gods. The capacity of the house was said to be about 2,000. Originally, the theater was supposed to be named after its primary patron, the Duke of Mount Pensier, but his father Louis-Philippe did not think it proper that a theater should be named after his son. Dumas proposed the Autre European as an alternative. But this triggered dissension among the other parties involved, and it was eventually decided that the name would be disrespectful of the Théâtre Francois. Videl finally proposed Théâtre Historique, which was considered particularly appropriate as the repertory was to consist mainly of dramatizations of Dumas's historical romances. The name was ratified by the government minister on December 23, 1846. By this time, Dumas had already departed on a trip to Spain to attend the wedding of the Duke of Montpensier to the Queen of Spain's 14-year-old sister, Luisa Fernanda, on October 10th, and then to North Africa to gather material for writing a travel book intended to advertise the newly acquired French colonies in that region, a project that had been initiated by the Minister of Education, 
Narcisse Achille de Salvadri. This left Hostin to assemble a company and begin preparations for the first productions, and when Dumas returned in January, these were already well underway. The opening, on February 20, 1847, with Dumas's play adapted from his novel, La Reine Margot, was an eagerly awaited event, and the Duke and his new bride were also expected to attend. The audience for the galleries began forming quarries 24 hours ahead, even though it was the middle of winter. It helped, however, there were soup cellars and bakers with bread hot from the ovens, and bundles of straw which could be purchased by those who wished to lie down. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books behind the story today, while we answered some of the questions you have about one of your favorite classic authors. All of the links for our show are in the show notes. Our show is part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you would also like to hear a story by the author we are currently featuring, check out the Bite at a Time Books podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Right now we are reading The Three Musketeers. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle. And I hope you come back next week when we answer more questions about one of your favorite classic authors.